This gas is like sunblock for the planet, and releasing it into the stratosphere might prevent the worst impacts of climate change. Got it? Yep. These are the folks taking matters into their own hands and working to fix the climate right now. People say we need to switch to EVs, install solar panels, but none of them have affected global temperatures because they're still going up. And that's where stratospheric aerosol injection comes in. So should we be tinkering with the atmosphere? Or will this open up even more dangerous possibilities? We know this works, and volcanoes have been doing this for millions of years. Like, global warming is a choice. We can choose to have a warmer or cooler planet. This is the craziest part of this entire thing. We're just two guys. We've done more cooling for the world than any of these competitors. Happy birthday. It's a controversial way to fight climate change, so keep watching to see if you agree. This is Hard Reset. Do you like seeing these balloons go up? Well, we like seeing thumbs go up. So make sure you click the like and subscribe button, or they'll fire me. If you want to get a sneak peek at the future, just pick up a Neil Stephenson novel. He has a ridiculously good track record at pre-inventing things, like Google Earth and the metaverse in his book Snow Crash, or Bitcoin in Cryptonomicon. And his book Termination Shock was the direct inspiration for this. Two guys with balloons and a camper van on a mission to cool the planet down. How many people can say that? In Termination Shock by Neil Stevenson, a billionaire gas station magnet in Texas builds the biggest gun in the world because Texas to shoot cylinders that turn into engines when they get to the stratosphere and burn sulfur dioxide to geoengineer the climate. It's like, wow, I must I must be like sunbaked in the brain or something because I don't understand what I'm missing here. Like every journal article I can find is saying that there's high consensus that this would create cooling and that the benefits far outweigh even bold visions of the potential costs of it. This is Luke Eisman. He decided to take the idea from Neil Stephenson's book and run with it. Luckily, his friend Andrew was very supportive. I just told him he was, he was crazy because it's such an absurd idea. You're telling me you're adding something instead of taking it away from the atmosphere? And so me being good friends with Luke, I started reading a lot of research papers and after six weeks, he convinced me to join and figure out how we can scale this up in a safe manner. These balloons are full of sulfur dioxide that can be released into the atmosphere and function as sunscreen for the Earth. Sort of like the opposite of a greenhouse gas. The greenhouse gas effect is essentially keeping more of the sun's heat on the planet than used to occur. It's directly proportional to CO2 levels. A gram of sulfur dioxide, roughly, offsets the warming effect of a ton of carbon dioxide for a year. So not only is it a little less sunlight reaching the surface, it's a little less sunlight reaching the troposphere, which means a little less of it gets stuck here from all of our excess CO2. You've heard of greenhouse gases. The idea is that some gases in the atmosphere trap the heat from the sun the same way that a pane of glass in a greenhouse lets you grow tomatoes in the dead of winter. Well, there are also gases that reflect the sun's energy, and one of those is sulfur dioxide. These gases reflect the sun's heat right back out into space. Don't believe me? Go ask a volcano. What we're trying to copy is this one in the Philippines that erupted in 1991 that injected about 10 to 15 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. So 66,000 feet and above, double the height of where commercial airliners fly. This one volcanic eruption cooled the earth by 0.5 degrees Celsius. We had existing satellite infrastructure that detected this volcanic eruption and confirmed the actual cooling. 0.5 C is pretty massive because right now we just cross 1.5 C as this threshold of no return. Another major source is, well, us. We release massive amounts of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere every year. This was the case with container ships and other large maritime vehicles. They had very high sulfur content fuel until a couple years ago, rules changed requiring less sulfur dioxide in the fuel. And so once that stopped, scientists noticed that there was a spike in global temperatures and actually contributed to why 2023 and 2024 was the hottest in recorded history. She can actually see a difference in reflectivity from these really popular shipping routes like Shenzhen to LA. But releasing sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere from shipping vessels is not a good way to cool the planet. 
Releasing it at the surface like that has the least amount of cooling impact and the largest amount of negative impacts. With the shipping emissions, we were applying the sunscreen on our face with our eyes and our mouths open. Then we would just immediately jump into the pool because if it's in the troposphere, this is where all living species are. It only lasts for 10 days. But if you put it in the stratosphere, it lasts from one to three years. It's like putting sunscreen on by closing your mouth and closing your eyes and spraying your whole body instead. Think about the greenhouse. Putting up a shade to block the sun's light inside the greenhouse isn't a good idea. The heat is already trapped inside. You have to bounce the sun's light away before it gets to the troposphere. And you do that by reflecting it away at a much higher elevation. And because there's very strong winds in the stratosphere, it's around 20x more effective per gram released. People immediately think acid rain. This is gonna just melt our faces off if we do this. But the amount to counterbalance that warming is less than a million tons, which is a very, very small amount. Because one gram of sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere offsets the warming effect of one ton of CO2 for a year. So it's a one to million leverage. Right now, humans already release about 70 million tons of SO2 into the atmosphere every year. We just do it in the worst way possible. Andrew and Luke are proposing we put roughly 10% of what we already have in the atmosphere to the stratosphere to cool the planet down. An important thing to know about this process is that releasing sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere doesn't remove any CO2. The climate will still be acting like a greenhouse, it'll just be getting less light that warms it up. And since the SO2 eventually descends back down to Earth's polar regions, you need to keep reapplying it. Kind of like sunblock. So how do you go about hacking the climate? Getting sulfur dioxide to the stratosphere is actually really, really simple. Like, you don't need an airplane or a rocket. You can, you can just do it in a van with some balloons. These balloons are filled with a mixture of sulfur dioxide and hydrogen. Yes, hydrogen, the explodey gas. Uh, hydrogen obviously is more buoyant than helium, but it's also a little bit more explosive, uh, like a lot more explosive. How do you manage to mitigate the safety things on that? We're it goes up, so that helps. Um, some friends a couple years ago had remote-controlled little battle balloons with a, a like toaster wire or nichrome wire on the front of them in hydrogen. We did a test for it at my warehouse, and that was pure hydrogen. Since then, I haven't really been as scared of it as I was before. It's just like a little flare-up. Did your eyebrows ever grow back, or? <laughs> Also, one thing to note is that these balloons are made of latex and they're biodegradable. All right, this weighs 1.525. Most of the work here is measuring and monitoring. Each balloon is measured to make sure it has the right amount of sulfur dioxide. Attach it like so? Roll it over it, right? Yeah. It's like they taught me in health class. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but... <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, is this time off? Let me know when you want me to let go. It's like the white sphere from the prisoner. It's gonna chase us down if we try to leave the village. The computer is the only part that's not biodegradable, and it's meant to be found and returned. And so then we'll be tracking that balloon going up into the stratosphere via telemetry. And you'll see it on our laptops and our screens. As the pressure drops outside, the balloon will expand. Eventually, it will explode, releasing both the hydrogen and the sulfur dioxide. If we don't make it to 20 kilometers, we don't count it as a delivered order, and we launch again. How often do you have these carryaway toddlers on accident? <laughs> Luke and Andrew were kind enough to let me release one of the balloons, and I used the opportunity to shamelessly plug yeah. Hard Reset on social media. Wow, that is a big balloon. I'm Nick with Hard Reset, and if this video gets a thousand subscribers, we'll pay to release 10 balloons just like this one. Actually, how much do these cost? <laughs> 1,500 <laughs> each. I'm Nick from Hard Reset, and if <laughs> this video gets a thousand subscribers, we'll pay to release one of these balloons. Three. Right now, the scale of this operation won't make a measurable impact on the temperature of the Earth. At least, we don't think so. We're launching about 10 balloons per month. Right now is where we're at. How many balloons do we need? That's the billion-dollar question, actually. 
It's hard to say because no one has really studied this until now because it seems like it's too controversial. So people have actually tried to do this before. There was a project called Scopex, who was funded by Bill Gates, got $20 million from him. They were gonna launch a balloon with just instruments in Sweden 15 or so years ago. Some well-meaning but misguided climate activists and some local native groups opposed the launch, even though it was only instruments. Just last year, Scopex officially was canceled, having released zero particles with all that money. But is it really controversial? I mean, this article from the New York Times makes it sound like NOAA is actively trying to hunt down people who might be trying to geoengineer the planet. No, I don't mean Noah, the guy who couldn't fit dinosaurs on his boat. I mean Noah, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Anyway, in reality, the folks at Noah and Make Sunsets are in open communication with each other. That article sounds very adversarial for no reason at all. Like Noah has built this team uh, that is spending currently roughly a million dollars per year to detect stratospheric aerosol injection deployments. The only people who are doing that is us. <laughs> One of the main scientists that were referenced in that story, we've been talking to that guy for the past two years. <laughs> we share a lot of data with him. Yeah, we've maybe a little too much leaned into this cowboy renegade image. One of our customers and investors was like, wait, I didn't realize this is legal. Uh, it is depressingly large amounts of SO2 that you can emit before you even come close to touching any EPA stuff. Occasionally some crazy conspiracy theorists will email us. But yeah, people are concerned about weird stuff in the sky. I get it. We strategically chose to be as open as possible. If you go on our blog right now, we share how much money we have in the bank, what our sales are, what we failed at, what we succeeded at, and what we're working on next month. No one really seems to doubt the effectiveness of this technique, and no one denies there might be downsides. The real controversy is a bit more nuanced than that but more on that later. For now, the question I keep coming back to is whether it's better to do nothing and be blameless for whatever happens, or to do something and accept the consequences of an imperfect solution. I don't think there's a moral difference between action and inaction. Like It's just a false sense of lack of agency, I think is what it boils down to. It's our fault either way. 2.3 average Americans' lifetime emissions mean that an extra person is going to die from direct heat-related causes between now and 2100. So that's blood, not literally on our hands, but figuratively. This is a hard reset for climate change in the sense that the climate theater that we've been acting out for the past 30 plus years has not been working. Literally, Mother Nature already showed it to us. We have to copy it. We have to try it at least once. Then the people can decide if this is something we want to do in the long term. We've asked scientists how much of this we'd need to do. We may need to do this up to 0.1 or even 0.2 C, and then shut it off for a couple of years to be able to show a measurable impact. Luckily, there are balloons that NASA already launches that have a payload of one ton. So about the weight of a small subcompact car to counteract that warming that we put into the atmosphere two years ago, we only need 38,000 tons of SO2. So that's 38,000 really, really big balloons, but you can see how this can scale very quickly. That's a surprisingly attainable goal, but it might require something fancier than balloons. Balloons are the right MVP, the minimum viable product for us. The two lead academics in this field have written extensively about how we need to spend 10 years and $20 billion to build a custom high altitude aircraft that can deliver a huge quantity like 10 or 20 tons, maybe even more, of sulfur dioxide per launch to the stratosphere. That's an adventure I'm ready to have, you know? Somebody who can <laughs> ensure that we're allowed to fly those is a, is a customer. So it's doable, but would we want to do it? Climate change is one of the most controversial issues of our time, and how we handle it or ignore it will have huge impacts on the lives of real people. So the stakes for something like this are very high. As I've researched this topic, I've found there doesn't seem to be much doubt that releasing sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere can have a measurable impact on cooling the planet. But wouldn't it just be better to remove the excess CO2 from the atmosphere? The largest direct air capture plant in the world right now can only remove 4,000 tons of CO2 per year. 
to remove a ton of CO2 from the atmosphere can cost anywhere from $400 to $1,500 per ton. We charge $1 per ton. We can keep reapplying that sunscreen year after year while you know, direct air capture figures out how to scale up this technology. Stratospheric sulfur dioxide injection is not a risk-free activity. There are potential impacts, like how will this impact weather patterns? How will shading the planet impact plant growth? Will it impact the ozone layer? We don't have good answers to those questions because we haven't studied it much. But the research that we do have shows those potential impacts are probably much smaller than the impact of unmitigated climate change. So here's the real question. If we started cooling the planet with sulfur dioxide, would that just encourage humanity to keep pumping out more CO2 because we were masking the impacts? Yeah, the moral hazard of this gave me pause for like a month plus. Specifically, if we have this down button on the global thermostat, does that mean that we'll just drill all the oil we can and burn it all? And I thought about this for a while and then I got out of my mental ivory tower and looked at the numbers and we're doing that anyways. Catastrophic things will happen if we stop using fossil fuels, regardless of us doing solar geoengineering or not. It's insane the pace of how much energy consumption is currently happening and we can't pump the brakes here. And so we need some kind of tourniquet to stop the bleeding in the meantime. And that's what this intervention is. The best case scenario here is that we phase out the use of most or all fossil carbon and start pulling excess CO2 out of the atmosphere. And then we use sulfur dioxide just to tweak global temperatures until things get back into balance. The worst case scenario? Well, if we use sulfur dioxide to cool the planet while pumping more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we'd essentially become addicted to sulfur dioxide, creating a situation where we'd need to put more and more up into the stratosphere to prevent a total catastrophe. If we all of a sudden stop using stratospheric aerosol injection as we're still building up the CO2 levels. There's this other term called termination shock. This is us and there's a shade. All of a sudden we remove that shade very quickly. Then you'll feel the full force of that heat. And so that's a, that's a big risk as well. But we don't have any other option. We cannot get off this bus. Reality rarely veers into a worst or best case scenario. We live in a messier middle ground. But that means we're gonna to need to make compromises as we build the future. It's likely that sulfur dioxide injection is something we're gonna to need to use or at least understand if we wanna make it to the next level of the game. Thanks for watching Hard Reset. If you wanna see more of our episodes about people who are building a better future, make sure you click the subscribe button and the like button right there. I'm gonna go back to building Legos.